Well, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful for the opportunity to step in and to address this audience. Um, it's actually uh, very intimidating. I'm noticing that as these meetings are going on, the quality is going up exponentially. Uh, so, um, oh, wrong button, okay. So, like many of us, my colleagues and I are interested, and I think there's really a marvelous uh, observation. Here we have a cross-section of a Geobacter sulfur reducens biofilm that's been grown on an anode surface. And as we heard a few times today, you know, each one of these cells is metabolically active and is somehow is transporting its respired electrodes through, you know, tens of microns of biological material to the anode surface. And that's kind of represented here schematically. And that's really just a, a marvelous basic fundamental process. It's a real interesting question. We're, used to thinking about electron transport processes in biological systems on the order of molecular length scales. We saw in Caroline's talk and other talks yesterday about multi-heme cytochromes that are, you know, tens of angstroms uh, in distance and they have hemes in them and that's considered long-range electron transport for most biologists. And here we're talking about a process that involves transport over tens of microns. So fundamentally it's a very interesting question we're all trying to, to try to get at. Um, to directly quote Derek, you know, uh, if we hope to exploit that property in synthetic biology applications, then rational understanding, uh, rational optimization requires rational understanding. And, you know, we saw how hard it was yesterday to impart transport to, say, E. coli to an electrode, but now we should also consider, you know, from cell to cell to cell through the biofilm. And that's going to be necessary to get the high current densities that give us the catalytic uh, activity that we want for useful processes, whether it's electrosynthesis or uh, energy transformation from biomass and, and uh, microbial fuel cells. So, um, so the model that we put forth uh, for the electron transport process is a, just a simple model known as electron hopping. And I'm showing it here schematically in a cross section of, let's say, that image on the previous slide where I have a cell shown here by this gray oval and another cell and another cell. The cells are decorated with, I'm going to call it an electron transfer mediator or a redox mediator or an extracellular cytochrome. I'm going to use those terms uh, inner, uh, going to use them back and forth. I think there's a lot of evidence that supports that they are extracellular matrix cytochromes, but it's, you know, these are complicated systems and nobody knows for sure. And, you know, we're learning about the mechanism. So I'm not going to say they definitively are, but it's our hypothesis that they are. And the cells might have pili, and they might have these mediators or cytochromes that are associated you know, on the cell membranes, in the matrix, and along the pili. And the model is elegantly simple. If I'm a cell over here, I somehow get my respired electron out to this mediator pool. And then the electron transport process happens by a sequence of electron transfer reactions among the cytochromes or the charge transfer mediators working towards the electrode surface. Now, the, um, Cornell raised a question the other night in the pub, and that is, you know, what is the essence of this model? What does it really break down to? There he is. I'm looking for Cornell. And what it breaks down to is simply that what it says is that if this electron has to get from here to the electrode surface, it has to temporarily reside on, some, on, a, on redox mediators as it percolates or transfers its way to the electrode surface. And that would be different than, say, the electron sort of emanating from a cell onto a cytochrome and then through some other mechanism, you know, shunted directly to the electrode surface. And so what that means is that for this electron to get from here to the electrode surface, it's going to be sensitive to the oxidation state of these, these charge transfer mediators. So, for example, if they're all reduced, this electron has no hope of getting over there. Conversely, if they're all oxidized, uh, it has the best path, the most least restrictive path. So the electron transport phenom uh, getting from anywhere in the biofilm to the electrode surface is very dependent upon the oxidation state of these mediators in the biofilm. Um, we, you know, the electron hopping falls out of, um, oh, one thing I wanted to point out here, uh, I, I understood there was not enough Nernst equation in this conference. It's an electrochemical conference. And so we have an interesting uh, situation here, a heterogeneous situation. The, the, the microbes are reducing these mediators, right? They're pushing electrons into the mediators according to the model. But the electrons only come out on this plane on the electrode surface. And in addition, if 
this last step is reversible, uh, meaning electrons can go in and out. You know, the, these sites can be oxidized or re reduced equally well. Uh, then the Nernst equation can be applied to, def to de um, describe the relationship between the oxidation state of these last groups here and the electrode potential here. And so what that means is that when I poise the electrode at a very positive potential, this term here goes to one, meaning that all the cytochromes are oxidized. And that's good because that means as the microbes are feeding electrons in, they get sucked right away because any time an electrode resides there, the Nernst equation says, no, this can't be reduced. It's got to be oxidized and pushes the electrons out. Conversely, if I make the potential very negative versus the formal potential of these groups here right at the biofilm electrode interface, then this term goes to zero, meaning they're all reduced and I can't get any electron transfer across um, the biofilm. So the, the electrode potential sort of controls the oxidation state here at this plane, and the rest of the oxidation state of these cytochromes is determined by the metabolic activity being uh, distributed across the film. Um, so modeling a biofilm just simply as a, um, as a, say, an ideal redox charge transfer mediator that's immobilized into a film, and um, and that modelizing the microbes is just enzymes that turn over acetate to form carbon dioxide. And assuming that they're all the same and evenly distributed, you get an interesting relationship between the oxidation state of the biofilm as a function of a depth in the biofilm. And that is, if you're poisoning your electrode at a very positive potential, then it's all oxidized right at the electrode surface. And that's indicated by this probability function be, of being oxidized being one. But that as you move away from the electrode surface into the biofilm, the cytochromes are being, or the mediators are being progressively reduced. And that makes sense because they're farther away from the oxidizer, which is the electrode surface. The, um, the modeling also predicts this interesting shape, is that uh, the slope will be sharp close to the electrode surface and then sort of drop off as you get farther away. And so the shape of this curve has two consequences. The first is, is if I'm a microbe at some distance z in the biofilm, the amount of oxidized mediator that I have around me will be higher, closer to the electrode surface than, say, farther from the electrode surface. And what that means is I have essentially more electron acceptor. And the limit that this curve goes out, eventually all the cytochromes will be reduced near the electrode surface, and the cells don't have any place to dump their electrons. And so we expect a limiting, the, the, uh, this model predicts a limiting finite thickness for a biofilm. You're essentially electron acceptor limited because the electron acceptor is all the way over here. The other thing that's interesting is the slope of this curve. Now, in the hopping mechanism, what drives the electron to move, say, towards the electrode surface versus away from the electrode surface is simply if you have more electrons away from the electrode surface, uh, the tendency is in a random hopping event for the electrons to move towards the electrode surface. In other words, it's completely analogous to diffusion. In fact, mathematically, it's, it's indistinguishable from the microbe secreting a soluble mediator that then diffuses to the electrode surface because uh, in the reduced form, it's actually uh, it's diffusing in the reduced form, being, being oxidized at the electrode in the oxidized form. So, so uh, what that means is that the rate of electron transport through the biofilm in any plane in the biofilm can be described by Fick's law of diffusion, which means is that the rate of electron transport is proportional to the slope, in other words, the concentration gradient. So that if I'm an electron over here, the driving force to get me to the electrode is a lot lower than if I'm an electron over here because the concentration gradient uh, of this curve is much steeper. Um, and so that gives a double whammy. So for cells that get farther and farther away from the electrode surface, even if there is oxidized mediator for them to push their electrons into, once it's in that electron transfer mediator pool, the driving force to get that electron towards the electrode surface is very low. Because the gradient, there's, there's not much difference on one side versus the other side of this line here in terms of having more reduced over here versus here whereas the difference here, the slope is much steeper. Um, so in a diffusing species, we think of the fixed law saying, well, the transport will be proportional to the slope by the diffusion coefficient, which has something to do with how far a molecule will move incrementally in a certain time period. In this model here, the molecules are not moving, but the electrons are effectively diffusing from mediator to mediator. And the characteristic diffusion coefficient is given by essentially the electron transfer rate constant, how quickly electron can get from mediator to mediator. Uh, and some other terms, which I won't go into. Um, so why do we think it's a diffusive process, uh, lead, uh, uh, making us speculate that it's a hopping mechanism? Um, so this is non-turnover voltammetry for a DL1 biofilm. So you know, essentially, I think most of you know this. 
but um, if I start off at a very oxidizing potential of my electrode, say the energies here versus the formal potential of the mediator, and I start sweeping negative, what I'm essentially doing is raising the potential energy on the electrode, and eventually the electrons get high enough that they can start flowing into the mediator pool and reducing the mediator, and that's what I see. Then on the reverse scan, I start lowering the electrode potential, and the electrons will eventually start flowing out as it gets lower and lower. Um, important to note here is that I'm actually reducing the biofilm here. I can actually push electrons into the biofilm, uh, into the mediator pool on the cathodic scan, just as well as I can pull them out of the anodic scan. If I do this at faster and faster scan rates, I see curves that grow uh, in scale, and there's a classic relationship between the peak height and the scan rate. And when you see a peak height in a voltammetric current increasing with the square root of scan rate, that is a clear characteristic, a characteristic of a diffusion process. In other words, we're, we're the, the, the shape of this current curve associated with pushing charge into and out of the biofilm uh, reflects the lag in time required as the electrons are hopping or diffusing uh, into the biofilm. And then when I'm pulling them out, they're hopping or diffusing out. Um, let's see here. OK. That's on non-turnover conditions. Under um, turnover conditions, I have here is the very slow scan rate, classic catalytic voltammogram in the presence of acetate. So now I have my electrode at a very positive potential. I have the electrons coming from acetate into the microbes, into the mediator pool, and then out to the electrode surface, all in a downhill energetic process. But as I start raising the potential of the electrode, I start making it harder and harder for the electrode to accept electrons in the mediator pool. And eventually, as I get high enough, they thermodynamically can't go uphill, and I shut this down. This happens to be during growth of a biofilm. Uh, and these curves are normalized to the maximum catalytic current obtained at each stage of growth. And what this curve, the overlying of these curves says is as the biofilm is growing and acquiring biomass, <coughs> the mechanism of catalytic activity is the same. We're just requiring more catalysts and mediators, that is the cells and, and the charge transfer mediators in the, in the biofilm. This is now scanning at a faster scan rate in the presence of acetate. So I see the same general sigmoidal curve, which characterizes the catalytic process, but superimposed upon it, I see this transient curve. And what's happening here is, is as I'm sweeping faster and faster, remember as I'm sweeping the potential of the electrode, in either case, I'm also driving charge into the biofilm to reduce those, those mediators. I can't see it here because the time that I'm doing it is so long that the current at any given potential is very small and I can't see it. When I start sweeping at a faster and faster scan rate, I can actually see this curve. These, are, again, are for different stages of growth in the biofilm. Um, and this curve shape here associated, in this case, with pushing charge into the biofilm and then pulling it back out, this, sh this curve shape is a classic curve shape in voltammetry, which is associated with a diffusional process. We're actually capturing the lag. I'm trying to push electrons into the biofilm. They're getting across into that first pool near the electrode surface. And then those electrons have to hop into the biofilm. And there's a lag time associated with the physical diffusion process. And so this, this is a classic curve um, described by Nicholson and Shane. If you should crack open Bard and Faulkner to, to read more about that. Um, so, um, so here's an abiotic system that uh, we essentially have been modeling our biofilm catalytic properties on, including electron transport. And this is, of course, developed by Adam Heller. Adam Heller uh, has developed these series of redox polymers where we have these metal center groups. And th these are polymers, and you get electron transport between interactions between these metal centers and the polymer. And of course, what he does with these is subsequently ensnare these with glucose oxidase, or ensnare glucose oxidase in here. And it's the basis of a commercial uh, glucose uh, blood sample um, glu uh, monitors. But this is just the voltammetry, again, showing the square root dependency of the peak height as you increase the scan, scan rate, having to do with the diffusion-like processes as electrons go from osmium to osmium hopping uh, through this hydrogel. Um, so you know, Daniel showed some data earlier. There's nothing in the voltammetry that we can say, well, these are definitively cytochromes. You know, other than maybe it's consistent that the potentials at which we see the charging and discharging in the biofilm is consistent with those of known cytochromes and biofilms. But I think um, there's a lot of evidence now supporting the notion that these mediators that we're proposing that are the operative charge transfer uh, agents in the biofilm are cytochromes. And I think most compelling is the work by Daniel Bond where he essentially showed the voltammetry where we watch charge go in and out 
of the biofilm during electrochemistry correlates directly with the change in oxidation state of cytochromes monitored by UV vis spectroscopy. And then there's been some really nice studies emerging on using Ramon spectroscopy, which is also very cytochrome specific. Um, so let me talk, turn to some data here. So we've been working with uh, IDAs, interdigitated microelectrode arrays, and these are an electrode geometry that were developed. Um, Steve Krieger's here, so I have to be careful, he might correct me. Um, I would say in the early 80s, um, in two gra groups that I know of, uh, the Murray group at Chapel Hill, where actually Steve and I both did some training, and the Wrighton group at MIT, where I also did some training at. And these are really elegant electrogeometry, specifically optimized for studying electron transport uh, properties through thin films that are deposited. And so what you have here is a gold surface evaporated onto a glass slide and created either by mask or by etching uh, is, a, is a simply a pattern where you remove in this sort of rectilinear fashion some of the gold, creating a gap, you know, bisecting your gold electrode into two electrodes. And the fact that um, by using this sort of um, undulating or rectilinear <coughs> gap here, what you're creating are two sets of microelectrode bands that are interdigitated. I don't know, they're interlocked. So you have fingers that are next to each other, but every other finger in the array is terminated here, connected to electrode two, or comprises electrode two. So this finger and this finger, and in between them are electrodes that are uh, comprising electrode one. So if I actually took a cross section you know, through the array, I would have a band of electrode one, and then next to it a band of electrode two, electrode one, electrode two, and these guys are connected together, and these guys, in our arrays we have say 50, I'm sorry, 100 bands, 50 pairs, if you will. And the beauty about this is that it combines um, essentially a really long gap that's separating these two electrodes into a very compact form. So we have an electrode, a total electrode area on, a, on the scale of a few square millimeters, but the gap that's separating these electrodes if you took the sums of this gap and this gap and this gap, it's 48 centimeters. And so in an experiment where we're actually passing charge from one electrode uh, to the other, um, that gives us really high signal to noise in our measurement. So here what we've done is it's poised both electrodes, all the electrodes, at an oxidizing potential. We usually do 0.3 volts versus silver, silver chloride. And in the presence of uh, Geobacter and, uh, and under electron trans uh, electronic separate limiting conditions, we can grow a biofilm on these gaps and if the architecture of the uh, array is such that the separation between the bands is on the order of the thickness of biofilms, we usually get 20 micron biofilms in thickness, and we have 15 microns here in gaps. We can actually get the, the, uh, the biofilms to grow and then kind of fuse together and form a confluent biofilm on the electrode surface. So, um, so there's kind of two quick experiments I can show you that we do here. The first is the catalytic voltammetry where all the electrodes are shorted together and the arrows here are sort of representing the flux of electrons from acetate oxidation on the biofilm towards the electrode surface. And I get this, uh, this you know, classic catalytic voltammogram here. If I actually separate them using a bipotentiostat so I can measure the current going into this electrode and this electrode and all the other ones comprising electrode one, separately from electrode two and all, you know, all the bands comprising electrode two, that's what I get here if I sweep them simultaneously. That's what I get here. And the sum of these two curves equals that. I really haven't done anything differently. I'm just measuring the sum here together, or I'm measuring them separately and adding them together. But if I actually do this configuration here, where I only sweep electrode one uh, and leave electrode two at open circuit so I can't gather electrons, then I get a catalytic voltammogram like this. And which is interesting is, is I'm actually collecting more current at this electrode, so the current density at this biofilm electrode interface is actually higher here than it is here. This is the condition at which the biofilm is grown, and this is the thickness that was achieved uh, by self-limiting. You know, I don't do anything other than let the biofilm grow, and it achieves its own self-limiting thickness. Um, and, and as a result, I get a certain current density per electrode. When I operate them separately, I'm actually getting more electrode more electron flux to each electrode, indicating that that's, this last step was not the limiting step in, 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 bi in, in, gro in growing the biofilm. And I, I don't know if I, I mean, might have fumbled on that a little bit there. But um, the point is, is that this last step, getting the electrons between the biofilm and the electrode, 
surface appears not to be the limiting step uh, when I'm growing the biofilm because I can actually pull more current through the, through this interface when I do the electrodes one at a time. The fact that I'm getting more electron, uh, more current here, is also very indicative of a diffusive process. Here the electrodes are sort of competing against each other. So if I'm a, bio, a microbe over here, I might be able to throw my electro, electron this way or this way. Here now it's no longer competing and this, this electrode is gathering more electrons from say a larger volume of the biofilm. Um, so this is a catalytic voltammogram recorded separately and the inset is a non-turnover voltammetry. And here's our Nernst equation. And what we have done, uh, we've published this in the past, is we can actually fit the catalytic curve uh, based on the Nernst equation. So here, what essentially the Nernst equation does is define the oxidation state at the electrode surface. The biofilm sets up at, uh, will set up what it's the oxidation state at every level in the, in the biofilm surface. And that dictates the rate of electron transport to the electrode surface and we can get um, the catalytic curve. And the key thing is this is a, a, a derivative of the um, Nernst equation where we included this term G. This is a pretty messy uh, voltammogram and it, what it indicates here is actually probably an overlap of a number of different cytochromes or charge transfer mediators. And so the inclusion of G here says essentially allows me to determine the voltammetric window I need to go to make it fully oxidized to fully reduce. And as I make this number smaller than one, then the, the, the voltage range that I need to do to go from the fully oxidized to fully reduced cytochromes at the electrode surface is wider. And so we can fit this curve. And what it says is G, a good curve is um, G equals 0.8, which says that there's some heterogeneity of the, of the charge transfer mediators that are involved in the electron transfer process. Um, now, I'm, I'm sweeping one electrode and monitoring the other. And so when they're both at open circuit potential, they're both pegged at almost minus 0.6 volts. That's due to the fact that all the cytochromes or charge transfer mediators are being reduced by the persistence of acetate oxidation. I then, after a while, I then poise electrode one up here at 0.4 volts. Immediately, electrode two responses. It's no longer fully reduced. It is actually gone up a little bit in potential, indicating that some of the cytochromes near electro 2 are in the oxidized form, so that even by electro 2, even though this is not collecting electrons, these electrons can be moving from microbes near electro 2 to the electrode surface. And so the, the fact that I'm able to measure the potential at electro 2 while I sweep the potential at electrode 1 shows that I have a redox gradient or is indicative of a redox gradient between electrodes 1 and electrodes 2. And the redox gradient can, uh, persists when I have current flowing. And then once the current goes to zero, this is current co going to electrode one, uh, the gradient uh, is over. Um, I'm going to go now to some IDA measurements here. These are probably more clear demonstration. Here I'm driving, I'm putting a bias between the electrodes. Um, so, at this, uh, so in a voltammetric picture, I would be, say, simultaneously sweeping both potentials going from positive to negative potential and then back down, but at the same time maintaining a bias between them. And as a result, um, I should be able to drive charge from the more negative electrode through the biofilm to the more positive electrode. And in that case, I'm defining the oxidation state of the biofilm at both electrodes. And, and actually pinning what those oxidation states are and then creating the concentration gradient between the electrodes that should be driving electron transfer through the biofilm. And the key thing is this here. Uh, when, I, when both electrodes are very positive in potential, I can't get any electrons into the biofilm. Even though there's a bias between them, both electrodes are too positive, I can't reduce any of these charge transfer mediators. If I can't reduce them, there's no conductivity. And that's exhibited down here in this region here. At the other extreme, if, they're both, if both electrodes are very negative in potential versus the formal potential of the mediators, then all the mediators are going to be reduced. There's no holes, there's no oxidized mediators in the biofilm to accept an electron to get a, a hopping event to happen to get conductivity. So the model predicts all the way out over here we would have zero uh, conductivity. But as you start sweeping the electrodes in potential and as they start straddling the formal potential of the mediator over here, then you get a partially oxidized and partially reduced biofilm. You have electrons that are in the biofilm. You can push them in. There's holes to accept the electrons. They can hop and they can be pulled out from the other electrode. And so we, get, we sweep out this peak shape um, in the conductance or the current flow through the electrode. So this is the current going uh, into the more negative electrode and simultaneously measuring the current that's coming out. And we can fit it also to the Nernst equation, which interesting is, is the peak is now wider 
uh, indicating that the cytochromes that may be involved in this form of transport, this is not coupled to acetate oxidation. Um, there's no acetate in the system. There, uh, the, there, there seems to be a higher diversity of cytochromes um, um, than, than during the catalytic curve. Um, and then finally, we can actually do it in the presence of acetate. And these curves get a little bit complicated. So this is electron, this is uh, electrons flowing into the biofilm from the one electrode, and this is flowing out from the other electrode, but both electrodes are simultaneously act acting like anodes and acetate, uh, oxidizing acetate. We can subtract out the acetate contribution. I guess you can read about it in the paper. And you get qualitatively, and what, what's left is the current going from one electrode to the other, and it's qualitatively the same whether there's acetate present or not. We can drive electrons through the biofilm from one to the other. Um, and what the key thing is, is we sweep out this peak shape, which is um, highly characteristic of a hopping mechanism. Um, that is, the ability for electrons to get from one electrode to the other is dependent mm -hmm. upon the, the, the redox gradient that exists between the, um, the electrodes. So the last point I want to make in this slide here is that we overlay these data here. The midpoint potential of the catalytic curve is about here. And the, the formal potential of these gate measurements is much more negative. The gate measurement peak is also a lot wider than expected given um, based on fitting the catalytic curve. And so what that sort of points to is that there may be more charge transfer mediators in the biofilm that can engage in electron transport through the biofilm in a source drain measurement than are actually being utilized by the biofilm during acetate oxidation. And the reason is in acetate oxidation, I can only drive in electrons with, with so much negative potential because I'm ultimately constrained by the oxidation potential of acetate. When I'm using another electrode to drive electrons in, I can go to even higher potential and I can access more cytochromes that have more negative redox potential. Um, what are they doing there? I don't know. They don't seem to be contributing to catalytic current. Um, so um, in conclusion, I want to acknowledge my um, my co-authors, uh, colleagues Sarah and Jeff, Rachel and Stoss and ONR and NRL for funding and I'm happy to answer any questions. So the you have more, you know, a, a better ability for the a higher driving force to pass the electrons through. Yeah, the, and according to a mediator model, if you um, if you apply a more positive potential to the anode, uh, the mediator is sort of determines the the. Um, the rate of the, the, the uh, electron transfer reaction between the mediator and the electrode is what's the final step, right? And so once the electrode becomes positive of that, you don't get anything thermodynamically. You can make it more and more positive. If it's, once it's positive enough, the electrons flow through. It doesn't matter if you make it any more positive. So experimentally, most people observe as you start poisoning the anodes more and more negative, I'm sorry, more and more positive, you don't get any increased biofilm thickness at all or any, or any uh, higher catalytic activity. So, and this, this data is all from 100 millivolt imposed potential yes. across the gap? Yes. If I understand it, the higher potentials, you impose 100 millivolts, you, you don't see any current flowing through your gap. Or you, see, you, you don't see much, you don't see any current flowing across your gap at that. Yeah, so, so, so if both electrodes are very positive in potential, so they're down here, they're both positive of the um, formal potential of the mediator, then there's no current. So what if you impose a, strong, a slightly stronger potential if you go to a 200 millivolt? Sure. So, so, the, so the key thing to, to uh, in character, so this, all, this is all sort of based on classic uh, characterizing, you know, field effect transistors and redox polymer. Um, conductivities. And so, so the key thing to keep in mind is you have a, an energy level that's indicative of the formal potential of the mediators, and you have your two electrodes. And the only way you get electron transport is when the electrode potential straddle that. So you have an electrode, the formal potential of the mediator, and the electrode. Then you can get hopping from the electrode to the mediator to the electrode, essentially. Um, so in your case here, I can take one electrode, keep it down here, and then sweep the other electrode up and up and up. And that's what we published. 
in an earlier paper, and once it becomes negative enough, we can get current to flow, and then we can sweep this one back down, and it doesn't. It's sort of another way of representing the same phenomenon. I don't know, does that answer your question? Well, thanks, Lenny. That was interesting. Thanks,